The Purge, The Purge Anarchy, and The Purge Election Year are 2013, 2014, and 2016 films, respectively, all written and directed by James DiMonaco. In the near future, a new political party called the New Founding Fathers control the government of the United States of America. Under the guise of combating the crime rate, they have instituted an annual purge, a 12-hour period in which laws do not exist, save for a few minor exceptions. The New Founding Fathers not only permit murder, but encourage it, espousing a pseudoscience that claims human beings require this night, this release, in order to be functioning members of society. The rich benefit from this financially, spiking insurance rates, for example, and the poor, unable to afford security, are disproportionately murdered during purge night, prompting many to question the true motives of the New Founding Fathers. They want the impossible. Everyone to have. Some cannot have. Not enough to go around. The first film is a microcosm of the social science experiment of The Purge. A family has become wealthy by selling expensive security systems to suburbanite families who are afraid of the Purge rioters. The young son in the family allows a homeless man inside, prompting upper-class hunters to besiege the home. The family is forced with a series of moral choices about protecting themselves and protecting the homeless man, which makes them question the purge for the first time. In the second film, strangers attempt to survive the city, all of them having different reasons for why they are out on purge night. They are eventually kidnapped and sold as prey for the wealthy. In the third film, a senator is running for president on an anti-purge platform and she must escape an assassination attempt and a ritual purging. In the end, the senator is elected president and vows to use an executive order to immediately end the purge. The trilogy ends on a hopeful note. Reading criticism about the purge films, audiences have been quick to chime in that the system as outlined since the first purge film does not entirely add up, especially if it were utilized in the real world, both in terms of the fictional public acceptance of such a system and also its efficacy. Legalizing murder and other crimes for one night a year would not actually greatly reduce crime for the remainder of the year because that does not take into account the actual causes of crime. Many crimes happen in the moment, without much premeditation. In terms of crimes of necessity, meaning committed by the poor in order to improve their station, one cannot effectively loot a year's worth of goods in one night. Especially not safely, considering there are roving bands of masked murderers about. Many crimes exist out of a persistent need, not want, and that cannot be placated by allowing a brief free-for-all. The drug trade would not simply dry up. Addictions cannot be suppressed all year, and drug dealers would not shut down operations for 364 days and then reopen business for only one day. Criminal organizations simply could not afford to close up shop, not to mention the fact that much of America's drug problem is not homegrown, but rather foreign. Also, foreign-born terrorism would not cease for the same reason. However, with all of that said, the Purge series is not attempting to make a realistic portrayal of society. This is a form of sci-fi called social science fiction. It is less concerned with technology and more focused on how humans interact with one another as a community. It is not graded on its accuracy like hard sci-fi. It aims to caution and criticize, often through hyperbole. It's not so much that The Purge is somehow exempt from criticizing its exaggerated, impossible vision of the future. Rather, its exaggerated, impossible vision of the future is key to what it is saying about human morality. We need not take this so service level, so literally. Social science fiction and film in general is like a mirror reflecting society. But remember, a mirror is not accurate. It inverts the image, like a glove turned inside out. It's like seeing a portrait of George Washington in this scene, and then a grotesque caricature of Washington in this scene. The Purge superficially resembles the world, but it does not need to realistically portray the world in order to convey information. For the past 20 years, the NFFA has taken a legalized murder to decrease the poor population, which in turn keeps the government spending down. 
So let's give these films the benefit of the doubt and determine what The Purge may be trying to say. The Purge is an allegorical tale about America's rigged socio-economic systems and violent culture. Powerful corporations donate to political campaigns which marry the interests of the law and business. In the third film, for example, the deregulated government allows for insurance companies to drastically raise the premium on purge insurance for small businesses immediately before the chaos begins. People who profit from deregulation and a looser definition of law find new success during the purge, whereas people without means cannot even afford security. Okay, kids. Now, I know bad things do happen tonight, but we can afford protection. So we'll be fine just like always, no worries, okay? In the second and third films, working class Americans who cannot afford powerful security systems are unable to defend their homes or themselves from the purge. And those who cannot afford insurance must make the difficult choice between allowing their livelihood to burn or risking their lives in defense of what little they have. The most destitute, the homeless, are even more vulnerable. The deregulated price of medication forces an old man to sell himself to a wealthy family to provide a better life for his loved ones. In short, the policies of the new Founding Fathers, including the Purge, disproportionately harm the poor. The films make this case time and time again. Now, like I said, this is hyperbolic, but it is also not entirely unlike the way powerful economic interests in the government, the real-world government, create hardships on the poor that would not otherwise exist, like the deregulation of banks and pharmaceutical corporations. Medication is terribly expensive in America when compared to many other developed countries. The third film even takes aim at the National Rifle Association and politicians who are funded by them. The Purge series only indirectly alludes to race in the first two movies, and more explicitly references the races of the characters in the third. Racial disparities in poverty result from cumulative disadvantage, as the effects of hardship in one sphere affect other spheres. Poverty results not from a single source, but from a cumulative process. Any type of systemic disadvantage makes one vulnerable to other disadvantages. According to the National Poverty Center, a nonpartisan research center at the University of Michigan, in the United States, one of three African American children and one of four Latino children live below the poverty line, which is two times higher than the rate of white children. In America, racial minorities are statistically more likely to be convicted of the same crime committed by a white person. There are consequences to felony conviction beyond incarceration, such as challenges entering many occupations after release, not to mention losing the right to vote, and therefore change public policy. The Purge films address this rigged system indirectly, not referencing such statistics, but showcasing the races of those who are purging and those who are victimized. In the first film, we center on an advantaged white family who have profited from the need for enhanced security due to the Purge. The potential victim is a black man. His pursuers are a group of young white people who refer to the black man as a swine and refer to themselves as coming from good families. The only other black character in the film is this woman who has almost nothing to say throughout the film. The semiotics of the film are clear in what they are trying to convey. The upper middle class father remarks, these things aren't supposed to happen in our neighborhood suggesting that he was comfortable with it happening elsewhere so long as it never touched his suburban world. In the second film, we see downtown during Purge Night, a place where characters claim everyone goes to purge. The disparity between the mostly white suburbs and the inner city are more clearly defined in this film. Those being hunted, including but not limited to racial minorities, are being auctioned off by an exclusively white party. This man voluntarily sells himself to a white family to help his loved ones. The horrific historical implications should be clear. The leader of the resistance in the second film is black, and the new leader in the third film, the homeless man from the first film, is black too. In the third film, during the anti-purge montage, we see a close-up on this t-shirt, made to resemble Black Lives Matter shirts and slogans. The assassins are white supremacists, and wear swastikas and other white power logos. We also get a look at the new founding fathers in the third film, and not surprisingly, they are all white. 
I have had it with all these idealistic pigs. Religion is even more explicitly referenced in the films. During Purge Night, the warning says, May God be with you all. By the third film, the connection between the Purge and spiritualism becomes clearer as the Purge has become dogmatic, justified as being condoned by God. It has become its own religion. Purgers wear the word God on their masks in the second film, and the presidential candidate in the third film for the new Founding Fathers is a minister. Nobody ever said these films were subtle. The minister believes that the Purge cleanses us of our sins, much like a sacrament of reconciliation. The marriage between religion and politics has always been an uneasy part of American culture, a country partly built on Puritanism. The traditions are so ingrained in our government, how our laws are influenced by dogma, that it's difficult to imagine an America without it. The misuse of religion is highlighted in the Purge films, as the minister holds a kind of black mass for his murderous supporters. In the third film, Senator Rowan asks, Is murder our new religion? Religion, of course, can be used as a force for good. It's probably not a coincidence that the leader of the Resistance in the third film, and only major character in all three films, is named Dante Bishop, his first name a reference to the writer of The Divine Comedy, and his last name a reference to the clergy. His second in command is named Angel. I didn't think much of the first Purge film when I originally saw it three years ago, and I thought the Purge anarchy was, at best, an acceptable if unimpressive thriller. But watching all three Purge films in November of an election year, this election year especially, actually made the experience surreal. The disgusting villains are almost believable. The movies have somehow aged well and have become much more terrifying. Thanks for watching the latest episode of Renegade Cut, everyone. If you want to support the show, you can click the orange link to my Patreon. That's how all of this happens. If you want to subscribe and never miss an episode, click on the red link. If you want to watch more, there are some recommended videos below. I'll see you next week for another episode.